All right, guys, we've had so much feedback saying, Sumner, we love the land investing videos, but how the heck do you go and select markets to buy land in? It's a really good question. And truth be told, this is probably one of the most important aspects of building a land investing business. In the world of flipping land, a lot of the pieces of this business remain constant, our cost of data, our cost of direct mail, with the only variable that plays a huge role and has cascading effects in our business is what markets we decide to market to and in turn buy land in. We're gonna go pop on my computer. I'm gonna show you guys how we go and select markets to go find high ticket big properties that net us $10,000, $20,000, $50,000 profit per flip. And I'm also gonna show you guys how we go and source lower end entry level properties that we sell on owner financing terms to build up monthly recurring revenue in our land investing business. I hope this video is helpful. A lot of you guys have been asking for this, so let's dive in on top of the computer and get to it. Okay guys, buckle up, sit down, get comfortable. We are gonna dive into a pretty lengthy video here going through how we actually go and source markets. And I always tell folks that sourcing markets in this business is both an art and a science. And truthfully, a lot of the real data that we need to make informed decisions comes from mailing. It comes from actually going out there and doing campaigns. So before we dive into this, I just want to kind of give a little bit of preface here that when we find a market that we have a hunch or a hypothesis that it's good, we still don't know for certain. And that's why we still will do a test mailer to that market. Then we'll take that feedback, that data we get from that test mailer, and then we'll move on to a bigger campaign. Typically a test mailer is going to be about 500 to a thousand offers. And then from there, we'll go and actually send a larger sample, or maybe we'll go and diversify and go after different asset types or different property types within that market. So for example, there's, there's two different strategies here. Let's say we aggregate a list and we're going after one acres through 10 acres for a certain county. The list has 5,000 properties on it. What we might do is whittle that list down for our test mailer and just take the first 500. So take 10% of that list. We'll download it from data tree and then we'll market to that list. And then based on the feedback we get, then we'll go after the remaining 4,500. On the flip side, maybe we do a test mailer that's for, you know one to two acres and it comes out to a thousand offers. We send that out, we get a good response and we might go, hey, you know what? It worked for the one to two acres. Let's see if it works for the two to 10 acres or whatever it may be. And that way we'll kind of scale up and go after different property types that are in the same market. So we should get similar results. Two different strategies, more times than not, what I'll do is I will take just a fraction of the existing list. So one through 10 acres, I'm gonna take you know, 10, maybe 15% of the list, depending on that size do a test mailer and then go from there. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, the way we break it down in this business, there's two different kind of strategies. And those two different strategies are really gonna inform the property types that we're going after. So the first strategy is what I call buying equity. These are going after where you're buying properties that have real intrinsic value. These, these are properties that really have like a real use case, right? Someone might actually buy, build a home on it, got access to utilities. It's in a nice part of the county or a nice part of the sub market it's in or community that it's in. Typically, like someone that's going to buy this property, they're going to actually utilize it. Where on the flip side, there's a very weird niche within this business, which a lot of newer land investors don't fully understand. And that's going after and buying like entry level type properties. Here in the United States, there's such a pride of ownership when it comes to owning land that you'd be shocked that a lot of people want to buy these $2,000, $3,000, $5,000, $10,000 $10, properties that they'll never end up using. They'll never end up going to see them. They're just little desert squares, maybe out in the Southwest or little infill lots that are super cheap on the East Coast. And so people, they, they want to buy these properties and they typically want to buy them via owner financing. But these properties are they're just not great, right? The likelihood of anyone ever developing them is so unbelievably slim uh, because typically there's no infrastructure close to them. There's no one that's developed even anywhere close to these properties. And there's typically a reason for that. So different, two different strategies. We utilize both in our business, right? That first strategy of going and buying equity, those are the kinds of deals that we're able to you know, buy for 25,000, sell for 50,000, 75,000, whatever it may be, and really have a big cash spread where we also sell a lot of these entry level properties too, because this is how we built up our owner finance portfolio, which does anywhere between like 22 to 25 grand a month right now and just recurring revenue that we get from that. And so I like both strategies, but you wanna first identify what strategy am I employing here? Because that's gonna dictate how you should go and actually source markets to very different strategies. So what we're gonna start with here is going after buying equity, right? Three different tools you're gonna to need to have open on your computer. You're gonna need Redfin, you're gonna need uh, land.com, which is the rebrand of Lands of America. And you're gonna need Landwatch. 
I also recommend having data tree. If you look down below, we've got some discount codes on how you guys can get discounted pricing for data tree. So I know just based on prevailing market forces that I want to be buying land in Texas right now. There's a few markets that just have a lot of kind of wind in their sails in terms of future growth prospects. And as the economy is slowing, I'm becoming more and more mindful of where I'm buying land. Ideally, want to be in places where there's population growth, there's job growth, there's some kind of new construction going on. Like there's a real underlying demand for land in that area that's probably not going to totally shift if the economy starts to slow down it might lessen a little bit but i think those prevailing forces will continue to push through or if i'm looking at land for example in you know rural arizona or like upstate uh, california that way off the beaten path those properties in my opinion there's just not a lot of prevailing forces that are going to continue to make those um, those properties in demand and if we're going through a bit of a slowdown in the economy i want to be really mindful in terms of what properties i'm holding on to uh, because realistically things are going to take a little bit longer to sell realistically the future is unknown we don't know how the next you know 12 months or 36 months are going to play out so texas has been a market that i've been really keen on been a market that we've been working in for a while now and uh, it's a market i'd like to continue to, to work in all right, so this is um, how it all starts out for us. We go to land.com, we're gonna search Texas. I just know from a really broad perspective that that's where I wanna be working. This guy looks like he's 12 years old. I don't know how he's, he's selling people's properties. That's pretty unbelievable. Now what I'm gonna do here is kind of go and put in the price range of what properties I wanna be working in based on the data that I have from just our own deals that we're doing. Most of the properties that we have the best success with we are typically selling those anywhere between 25 and 150,000 as a list price. So that's just been our bread and butter pocket time and time again. And then the same is true for acreage. So like for us, typically anywhere between five and 40 acres is kind of our sweet spot. And in this case, we'll just plug that in here. Um, there's always going to be exceptions to this rule. I'm just using averages and I will use this just as a starting point. And then I can kind of ratchet down from there. But this is just to give me a list of what's going on out here. So right now we're looking at what's available and what's under contract. I want to go see it. Just what's selling. What are the recent sales? This is going to pull up uh, land all throughout Texas. So first thing that pulls up is Atacosa County. I've never even heard of that, to be honest. Um, so the next thing that I'll do is I will just go and take a peek over here. Atacosa County, Texas. Someone probably correct me for mispronouncing that that's okay all right so we're gonna go here we're gonna go land and what i'm looking for is i want to get a, a feel of what the overall sell-through rate or demand is out in this area the so last three months 38 homes have or 38 properties have sold last month nine homes have sold so typically what we like to see is between like 15 to 40 sales per month it really is going to vary though because you got to take into consideration the size of the county that's going to play a big role, whether the county's big or small. That's going to help dictate how many sales are going through. Uh, if there's a lot of late vacant land available in the market, that's going to also play a role. Um, and then on top of it, what the average price point is for land. So if land's super duper cheap, it might have a higher sell through rate versus land that's a little more premium. You can see these lots are definitely a bit more premium. It looks like the 10 acres are trading for like ten to $15,000 an acre. Uh, so premium land this is just south of san antonio we like to see that right you got a major buyers a major buyer pool up here with folks that could be purchasing our property so i'd like to see that um and just based on what i'm saying from this map here a ton of vacant land out here you also have just if we scroll through here it looks like let's kick this back to three months let's see if we can find any consistency in terms of the types of properties that are selling here so it's an interesting spread of like infill meets a lot of 10 acres so that just kind of informs us of what seems to be in demand out here so when i was going through and pulling my data and data tree i'd just be mindful of you know trying to source properties that people um, are buying right <laughs> let's give the market what it wants and let's go see what's actually for sale out here so i like to look at the ratio of what's selling through so there's 111 properties listed out here so roughly right now based on the last 30 days about 10 percent of the inventory is turning over every 30 days that's pretty good that's i've seen better but that's not bad i think 10 to 20 percent is pretty darn good especially then we have to factor in that some of these are at a really high price point and then I reckon if you go through and look at some of these listings, some of them are probably just priced out of control. Like look at this listing here, right? A lot of the 10 to 12 acres we're trading 
at like ten to twelve thousand dollars an acre. It's just this person's got it listed at like twenty thousand dollars an acre. And so if there's really bad pricing in the market, that can really skew the sell through rate because no one wants to buy it. Same story here, right? The guy's got it listed at over twenty thousand dollars an acre, over twenty five thousand dollars an acre. So if there's mispricing going on, that's gonna reduce the sell through rate just because these deals are going to be sitting in the market potentially forever just because they're priced so poorly. So that's a way to take into consideration here. So what I would do is I would, would it be married to this market? Sure, but I would take a note on it, right? So I make a note in my journal or make a note in my Google Doc. We typically use a Google Doc. We call it our Market Mondays document just because we go through and do this every Monday. Um, and now I'm going to continue going through the list, right? And there's some counties here that I'm familiar with that I just don't even want to bother with, like Brewster County. Nah, not really interested. A lot of the stuff that's kind of in the southwest portion of Texas, not really my style. Also, the data is very, very sparse out there. So all right, let's look at this Bell County here. Pull this up and. What I'm going to start doing is just building out a list and pitting these counties against each other, right? Um, we can only make comparisons based off of relatives, right? So it's like, we don't really know what a good market is until we have a list of a bunch of markets. And then we can start pitting those up against one another and getting feedback on, hey, this is a good market in relation to this other market. All right, so first thing that we notice out here is there's way more land out here, way more land. The next thing that I'm instantly noticing is that there's way more topographical features or just features to the land. We've got what looks like a a bit of a city here which that was not in the other county and you've got two lakes in here and some really wooded areas and some more kind of pastoral open land so there's going to be this is going to be a really tough market price so i would never just go in and do like a county-wide campaign here odds are you're going to get smoked or maybe you get a few deals but like you could just have a much higher yield if you went through and actually put together a more concentrated campaign sure. but first thing i'm saying is that there's a lot more land available out here Makes sense because there's some more metropolitan areas. And counting wise, it looks like it's roughly the same size as Alta Casa or whatever it was called. Um, okay, let's go see. So 11 homes, right? So a much smaller sell through rate. Uh, this is like a, what, 3% sell through rate relative to how many properties are listed out here. Last three months, 28. So we can see the sell through rate's actually a little bit better in Alta Casa. I just feel like I'm saying that terribly wrong. And this is going to be a tricky, tricky market, just given the fact that there's so much variance out here. And you can see some properties are in an HOA, you get some infill lots, you get properties next to the lake that are trading at a massive premium. So if I were to go after a market like this, I would be breaking it up into small chunks where I can find some kind of uniformity, some kind of um, homogenous type properties and then pricing it section by section by section by section. I typically just be using the polygon tool. Uh, within data tree now there's so many counties out here i've never even heard of let's go look at never heard of live oak county let's go take a look at trinity county and so this process i typically dedicate one to three hours every single monday to go through this okay so 48 homes or 48 properties sold in the last three months 22 in the last month and 149 but there is some kind of crazy subdivision down here that's really gobbling up all those listings out by trinity and then so if we come back here and look at where the properties are selling well most of the sales are down there as well hmm. interesting so if i was going after this market i would probably be going through and um breaking it down subdivision by subdivision because it looks like most of the activity is going on here in a subdivision a lot of these properties are outside of kind of like the search criteria that i had in terms of wanting to go after properties that are a little more up market um, but i would be taking notes on these subdivisions and then what i'd be doing is going and actually figuring out what are these subdivisions called and a really easy way to do that is just pull up the listing westwood shores and then i can go and actually search that within data tree and that'll give me some good feedback just in terms of being able to pull up all the properties that are just exclusively in that subdivision and then i'd build out my pricing based off of that um, so that's not something that i'm really obsessed with let's go take a look at jim Wells county and one of the beautiful things about this business is that over time the more markets that you comp the more markets that you um send mail to you start to build up this database of a kind of internal data that really no one else can compete with. So a lot of times when I'm going and doing my campaigns at this point, I'm doing a lot of remarketing to markets that were improved themselves. And then one of the secrets that we use is we go and actually market to the adjacent counties. The theory is, is like, hey, 
if this county works really well, the counties that are adjacent to it might have similar features, might have similar levels of demand, might have similar pricing. You know, it's not always true. Sometimes you're going to see a big variation there, uh, but it, it works out to be pretty consistent for us. So uh, if we look at this Jim Wells County, this is a little bit strange in terms of not much going on out here. Now, one of the kickers, though, is that in a lot of cases, like when we're looking at Redfin, it's just going to be pulling up MLS listings. So let's just go back and we'll use uh, Landwatch here. I'm going to show you guys something interesting. So if we go over to Bell County, for example, um, a lot of times on land.com or any of the land.com network of sites, you're going to get MLS listings that, that make it on there. But you're also going to get listings that are just on the land.com network of sites and then we make it to the MLS. So a lot of cases you can actually get additional data that you wouldn't be able to get um, on Redfin or Zillow or any of the websites that just aggregate from the MLS. So that's something that's really important to do. Now, the reason that we use land.com is because it allows us to have these really nice search filters initially. Now, once we actually go and find a county, I'll pull it over to a land watch. I'll plug that in. And what I like doing here is I can get a sense of, um, okay, available 686 properties under contract 140 which is very fascinating that is a very high number of properties that are under contract and then sold 652. the trouble with land.com and any of their websites is no one really knows how far back this data goes uh, we don't know if this goes back two years five years i think it's somewhere around two years but we're not certain you're also going to get some folks that just don't update their listing so like the 140 that's actually sitting here under contract how real is that? I don't know. You're also gonna get a lot of houses that get pulled into it, as you can see here. So you wanna be careful, but it's definitely, it's an important tool to kind of keep in your tool belt to cross-reference what you're seeing in terms of uh, listed and sold versus what you're seeing here on Landwatch with listed, sold, and under contract. You just wanna be mindful of not pulling in all this housing data, which is what we're gonna get pulled in here with. So I'm gonna do the same thing though. I'm gonna go Jim Wells County pop this in and see what we get here so 157 28 under contract 235 a lot of houses here as well so truth be told at this point i mean just based off the few that we've gone through here i think what i like the most is Octavacosa. God, i don't know why it's so hard for me to say a lot of characteristics that i like here there's a lot of vacant land um it's right outside of a major metropolitan area the price point is within the range that we like. The sell-through percentage is pretty high. Uh, the overall number of properties being sold is pretty darn good. And I'm also seeing that there's a lot of mispricing out here. So I think if we come in um, and price a little bit closer to fair market value, which I think like, for example, for the 10 acres, it's probably closer to like 10 to $15,000 an acre, maybe 10 to $12,000 an acre, where there's a lot of folks that are over 20 grand. So I think if we come in with a listing that's more competitive, we will sell like hotcakes. I bet we could turn our property in less than 30 days, um, especially because we've got this big buyer pool to tap into. You have to think who's most likely to want to own land um, in this county? Probably the folks that live here, right? And so this is a really easy place to target with their marketing. Um, it's just a really easy place to overall just have demand kind of seep in out here. So I really like that. Um, so this is this is based off of just a small sample size of the properties or the markets that we work through. This is what I like the most. Now, one of the interesting things about this county is it's pretty gosh darn homogenous. I'm also not seeing a ton of um, divergence in terms of like, hey, properties are worth way more up here versus way less down here, vice versa. Um, it doesn't seem like to be any crazy topographical features. It seems to be pretty much the same all throughout, right? Now, I need to do a little more research here just to verify that my hunch is correct. Um, but just because I've looked at so many gosh darn markets, I can typically pick up pretty darn quickly at um, pricing differences and topographical differences. And just overall differences in terms of features with the land. This looks pretty homogenous across the board. So potentially I'd break this up into sections for my pricing, but you might even be able to get away with pricing this entire county. Um, so something that's interesting then. Now, the, the next point is going after properties that we wanna go and actually sell uh, on owner financing. This strategy is a whole heck of a lot easier in terms of sourcing land that kind of fits that criteria. Really what we're looking for is supply and then more importantly, care, ownership characteristics. And I'll tell you guys what I mean exactly by that. 
Um, so what we can do here is we can kind of just reverse this process. Let's just go to a different state just for the simplicity's sake. So we'll go to a different state. Um, typically, a lot of the owner finance volume and transactions are going to be happening under $10,000. Um, there's going to still be deals that fall outside of that band. But if we think about first time landowners, what do they want? They want property that's affordable. So here we can just go, hey, between a thousand bucks and 10,000 bucks, it's typically not worth wasting your time with ridiculously um, uh, cheap properties that are you know, a couple hundred dollars. Now, what do we also know? People typically want property that's an acre and above, especially first time land buyers. Ideally, like the sweet spot for first time land buyers is five acres. I don't know this for certain, but based on my own personal data from the properties that we've sold, five acres seems to be the most favorited um, size range in this whole entire country. Doesn't matter if it's cheap, doesn't matter if it's expensive, five acres is that sweet spot. Um, so here, let's just go like, hey, between, I don't know, one and 10 acres, for example. And let's just see what pulls up. Now, typically a lot of these lower end properties, they are gonna be coming from subdivisions. Um, they're gonna be these plots of, of land that were chopped up and subdivided, typically in like the 70s and 60s, sometimes even before that. Um, and these are subdivisions that just never really got off the ground. You're gonna see a lot of these in the Southwest. Um, but you'll also find them just kind of sprinkled all throughout the country. But the vast majority of them are going to be in the Southwest. And you can build a whole entire business just going after these properties. And I'm giving you guys like the actual tactics that we use in our business. I don't really think anyone else talks about this, but you can build a multi, multi seven figure portfolio um, in terms of owner finance, um, total value and multiple, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars in recurring revenue that you collect every single year. I would forecast that by next year, our recurring portfolio should be somewhere between like forty and sixty thousand dollars a month, and the vast majority of it's going to be made up from these properties. We're pretty much doubling it every year, so every year we're adding about twenty grand or so um, of new recurring revenue. That'll be about a double for us this year. I don't think we'll continue to double. It'll probably stay pretty consistent at about $20,000 of additional monthly recurring revenue that we add annually. And it's really comprised of a lot of these properties here, right? So, all right, let's crack into it. Let me show you guys the process. So we're looking at what's selling out here. Um, one of the interesting things about these properties is it, it does not really matter what other people are selling it for necessarily. You wanna be within a bit of a window, uh, but if you're offering a competitive owner financing, the actual list price does not matter so much. Really what matters the most is first the down payment and then from there the monthly payment. So I'd say the down payment far and away is gonna be the most important factor. I um, mean, you still see a lot of folks that pull up their down payments just really, really high, like 2,500 down for a first time land buyer is outrageous. In my opinion, I think this would take a long time to sell. Something like this, I'm probably coming in at 99 down. My kind of school of thought here is that I'll take a lower down payment, have a higher monthly payment, um, and I'm okay sitting on my basis and not collecting it fully for six months or 12 months. I'm fine with that. If I can finance it at a higher total value, which typically you can, uh, typically if you have a low enough down payment, the folks that are going to actually go and look at these properties, they're just looking at the down payment and the monthly payment, they're typically not looking at the total value. Um, so I'm fine to, um, one, I'm fine to stretch it out and wait a little bit longer. And I'm also fine to you know, collect a little bit more um, in the total financing value versus collecting a ton up front. Um, so that's what matters most here. And then again, like with your offers, you wanna be within the realm of being reasonable, um, but you don't need to be uh, the, the absolute like perfect offer. I think you have a lot more leeway here when you're going after these bigger uh, properties that are gonna be more equity based and you're really trying to buy them at a discount. A, you're gonna to need to just naturally send more mail. There's gonna to need to be more marketing involved to get these deals. Your pricing is gonna to need to be more competitive to so a higher offer percentage, but also you're gonna to need to be a little more accurate. Typically the owners are much more aware of the value of these properties. Um, and you gotta be really, really on your toes in terms of how you list these properties because it really does matter. And you typically have to be the best deal on the market where in terms of your list price, where in these cases you can usually get away with being whatever for your list price and as long as your financing terms are favorable you'll do fine and especially if you can provide great customer service good marketing you ought to assume that these are first time land buyers they don't know the questions to ask they don't really know what they can or can't do with these properties so you really got to hold their hand and it's like go a long way um so enough yapping let's go and take a look at one of these properties here 
Um, do, 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 do. So this is a good example. Let me just pan through, and what we can do actually here, we'll go. Actually, no, hold on. We'll go through. What I'm looking for here is just the APN for one of these properties. Oh, that's Okay, so that is not in any kind of subdivision. We're either looking for a legal description or parcel number. And I'm going to just use this to start my search. Let's see if Clint's got anything here. No, it does not. Dun, 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 Okay, Sun Sites Ranches Unit 4. All right, we're going to pop over in the data tree. I'm going to show you guys exactly how we go and do this. It's pretty darn straightforward. Um, we're just going to go through and delete these. Doo -doo -doo. All right, so we're going to go Arizona, and this is in Cochise County. All right. So these are just some basic uh, search criteria that I have on here. And looks like data tree decided not to work. All right, let's pull up a new data tree tab. Sorry about that, guys. Data tree can be a little bit buggy here and there. All right, we're just going to get this pulled up. We're going to go states, Arizona. Cochise County, remove these filters, not needed. All right, so we're just gonna see, okay, well, there's 75,000 pieces of vacant land in the county, um, just based on the assessed improvement value that we have here. So there might be some properties that have improvements that are slipping through the cracks, but it's pretty unlikely. All right, so now what we're gonna do is go to the subdivisions tab. We're gonna go Sun Sites, what comes up here. So there's a ton of different, well, there's only two. Let's see, what is, what is this pulling up as? This is Sun Sites Ranches. Let's really space this out. There's multiple units here, yep. Okay, there's a bunch of units here. So what we can do is start, these are all subdivisions, right? And this is how I would go and do my pricing because these subdivisions are gonna be homogenous. Let's just say, hey, you know what? I wanna go after Arizona Sun Sites um, number two, just a, a sort of certain subsection of, uh, okay, certain subsection of the subdivision. I'm not sure why that pulled up as zero. Let's add a few more, see what happens. Okay, something doesn't make sense here. Hmm. Maybe we want to go after just the ranches and something's up with those. This is typically pretty darn accurate. Um I'll just look at the ranches. Potentially that's where we want to be. Go here. Okay, that makes a little more sense. Um, and what I'm gonna do is actually just trim this down so I can help show you guys the actual visualization of this data. If it's less than a thousand records, you can actually go and pull it up. <laughs> what the heck? Oh man, you can actually go and pull it up on the map, which we can go and visualize that together. What the heck? Oh mother. All right, we'll just take 34 in this example. One of the things I like doing here is you can see how it's been pulled up on the map here. If it's less than a thousand records, it'll pull it up for you. And so you can start going through and visualizing where these subdivisions are. And then what I'll do is on land.com, I'll go through and we'll go over to Cochise County. And then we will go and use the map tool and we'll go and actually find the same spot that we're looking here. So this is out by Sun Zona. So 
we go out by sunny zona. What we can do is you can see this is the subdivision. You can see the outline of the subdivision. We can actually start figuring out, hey, what are things selling for out here? Start finding some consistent themes, which is kind of the activity that's going on out here. That'll help us kind of figure out what we want to offer for these properties. Um, again, this is going to be, come down to your business model. Everyone wants to know somewhere, what's the offer percent you use? If anyone tells you that there's a set percentage that they use, run the other direction. It's contextual, it's circumstantial. It depends on what properties you're going after. It depends on your business model. There is no hard, fast rule. You must offer this amount for properties worth this much. Um, it's really an, uh, an internal decision that you need to figure out. You can have an offer percent that's 10% of its value and send out as much mail as humanly possible, or you can send out less mail and maybe have a higher offer percentage and get more deals. This really depends on what your business model is. Um, so this is how we would do it. Now, the next thing that I like to take a look at here is I like going through and um, going through and looking at some of the ownership demographic information. Um, so what, one of the things that you can toggle on and off with is going through and looking where they're located. So you can say, hey, that's not in Arizona. So you get some more out of state owners. Um, or one of the things that you can go and look at is last sale date. Go through and look at last sale date and say, hey, I wanna look at people that have owned the property for 20 years, 30 years, 10 years. Um, typically when we're going after a higher value or really buying equity, those kinds of deals, typically there's just not enough data available to get really critical with these variables that we're throwing at a data tree. But when you're going after these smaller properties that are typically more inexpensive and larger subdivisions, there's so much supply out there that it makes sense to go after the most motivated cohort of owners. Um, and so these are some of the tools that we like to use. It also just tells us some information about um, the demographic, right? Like if 90% of the owners live in a different state, you know the intrinsic value that they have or the connection they have to that property is typically very, very low. And so that's going to inform you on what you can actually offer in terms of a percentage. And so you just want to keep um, kind of a keen eye at figuring out these demographics. We will still use those tools even when we're going after bigger deals that we're buying um, at a real discount and flipping for cash. But typically in those situations, I'm not going to actually apply those filters. There's just rarely enough data to allow me to do that. In that case, my you know my actual data sets would be too small to hit my mailing goals. Um, but for these subdivisions, there can be tens of thousands of properties in them, and you typically need a way to whittle it down. Um, and you just want to see, hey, what what's like the actual breakdown in terms of folks that have owned these properties for a long time, live out of state. If you pair those two variables together, there's a good chance that they don't really care about those properties, and so that's going to inform you in terms of what you can offer in terms of percentage. So this is it guys this is really really just from a, a kind of a bird's eye view how we go about it you can see when it comes to actually generating um, these owner finance properties typically these properties are going to be much easier to acquire and so the market research portion is a lot easier a lot of your work is going to be on the back end in terms of the dispositions for the selling of those properties it's going to require talking to more people um, listing in more places, getting more eyeballs on them. It's going to take more work to sell those properties. Where the reverse is true, when we're going after these higher value properties that we're really trying to buy at a discount, these properties, it's important that we spend a lot of time doing our market research and our research in terms of pricing and building out a list because a lot of the work is going to be on the acquisition side. Once we acquire those properties, they're actually really easy to sell. Typically, those, those properties, especially the last few years, you put them on the MLS. In most cases, they'll pretty much sell themselves. Um, you need to talk to less potential buyers. Uh, typically, the people that are reaching out are much more serious. They know how to buy land. They've done it before. They've got cash in hand. They've got liquidity. It's a much different experience. And so you, get, you have to look at like when you're buying those bigger properties, it's front weight, weighted with the work on the front end, much less work at the back end. These lower end properties, it's a lot less work on the front end, a lot more work on the back end. You just got to know which battle you're choosing. I think there's room for both within your business. I always look at it in terms of an arc like this, though. So typically when people first start out this business, they start with the cheaper properties just to get their feet wet. Then they scale up. They're a solo operator. They realize, oh, my God, it's, it takes the same amount of work to do big deals. So they start doing bigger deals and they cut out the small deals and then they start building a team. And then they realize, well, now that I have infrastructure and I have a team and my business is like an assembly line, well, I can do both, right? Because you've got the internal bandwidth to do so. And at that point, they typically re-add the small deals back into the business because over time, get vertically integrated, right? We're free so many buyer leads. We have so much traffic coming to our website. They're asking for the small deals. 
we might as well deliver because we know how to source them and we've got the internal bandwidth to do so. And so I think that's kind of like the hero's journey in this business. You start with small deals, you scale up, you're a solo operator, you start doing the bigger deals by yourself. Then you realize, oh my God, I need to hire a team. So then you hire a team, then you realize, oh, now I have all this free time. Why don't we do a little bit of both? And we're still generating all these leads. So let's get vertically integrated and kind of cross-reference all the uh, material that we're using to generate leads and overall have a higher LTV for the people that you're generating. So anyways, that's the scoop there. Hope that was helpful. If you guys are interested in building your own land investing business, we've got some resources down below for you in the description. Hope this video was helpful. Take care.